Contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. In times of spiritual and moral chaos, it can be hard to discern truth from error and to apply it to all of life. God's word is not silent, and we don't have to be either. This is Once for All Delivered with Caleb Castro and Andrew Smith. We're getting into some things here that you wouldn't think they would be controversial, mm-hmm. but in fact end up being quite controversial because we start talking about, you know, a genuine striving against sin and uh, mortifying mm-hmm. sin. Sanctification is often talked about theologically in terms of two aspects, vivification and mortification. Vivification is the raising to life in new obedience and then the mortification, the putting of sin to death. As we live in a very antinomian age, there is a strong tendency, even within our Reformed churches and circles, to balk at anything that speaks of striving, mm-hmm. anything that speaks of effort in the direction of of holiness and righteousness. We've seen this through a, and we've talked about this before in other contexts, but a particular dualized, dichotomized idea of law and gospel preaching that finds its root in actually some Lutheran ideas that have crept into the Reformed churches and then has worked out in things like sonship theology and the teachings of Tully and Chavigian. Basically, law and gospel are so dichotomized that law is essentially reduced only to its use of revealing sin and bringing us to repentance for justification. Now, interesting here, as we looked at in question 76, repentance is not treated in the larger catechism as something that is merely done at conversion, but it is a part of our sanctification, something that persists throughout our whole lives, Christians ought to make regular practice of Mm -hmm. repentance. But in this theology I'm talking about, this antinomian-ish theology, basically, that's all the law is used for. The law brings us to our knowledge of Christ, and we receive Christ, and aren't you glad that Christ did all of that for you so you don't really have to think about it or worry about it anymore? That's not the way that Reformed theology, and that's not the way that our confessional standards talk about sanctification. There is a real renewal of our wills, an act of our wills in the direction of sanctification, although it is a grace, although it is worked in us as a gift of God, the application of Christ by the Holy Spirit, it does result in a real change, real willful action on our part in the direction of this vivification and mortification and being conformed more as volitional and willing creatures to the image of Christ. It's not merely, well, Christ did this for me, so I don't have to think about it or worry about it anymore. It's like, no, Christ did this for me, and I love him, and as my will was renewed by the Holy Spirit, I sincerely strive to do these things, to present myself as a living sacrifice of thanks. There's always a tendency when you take this approach I'm describing, you run the risk of becoming the the wrong answer to Paul's question, shall we sin so that grace may abound? May it never be. We don't use our status of being justified, our status of being redeemed in Christ as an excuse to be indifferent to sin. Whether we actually, you know, practice sin or not, the very thought that we don't even care about sin or think about sin, that's rather problematic in light of what we see here. If we look also at the Heidelberg Catechism, you know, we, we look at a couple of the keywords that basically are like the application side of what the larger catechism is speaking of. Because Andrew's talking about basically that this is the reality of justification, that it is once and for all uh, delivered once and for all. Title <laughs> honk, 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 honk. It is ours once and for all, apprehended by faith. It was a work that had been wrought in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. That's that's exactly what question answer 75 had been speaking of as something of a pretext for its then saying that likewise, it is a work of the Spirit as a fruit of that justification that we are then sanctified. If we are justified, we will also be sanctified because we're sharing in Christ. The Holy Spirit is basically drawing from Christ like a wellspring of life and applying those things that he has earned and all of his benefits 
sharing them with us constantly, giving us what we need throughout this life. Those things may be drawn upon then in our lives for our use. They're for us. We'll see later in the catechism. It is impossible for someone that is in Christ to not bear fruits. Right. This looks quite specific, though, which Andrew even alluded to earlier in speaking about how in the third part of the catechism, uh, the, the Heidelberg, it talks about basically what am I supposed to do now that I'm saved? Or it says, how am I to thank God for such deliverance? You show gratitude. You do good works. You continue to repent, mortify the flesh and and repent, uh, rise to life. So these things are all by faith. In the catechism, you see this answer 32, uh, using the URCNA's version here, says, because you are called a Christian, because by faith. All this talk of sanctification, it requires justification. It requires faith. So sanctification isn't being pulled like a cart before the horse in in saying that we are doing these things. It's a saying this is a result. If you believe in Christ by true faith, question answer 21, then you have this as a fact. And you see the words, I am a member. This again, referring to a living body. We had spoken of Christ as head and as believers as his body. The um, baptism that Christ received under John's baptism, we share in. Because that was when Christ was essentially anointed, if you will, that he was ordained formally. The same living spirit that fell upon in the form of a dove, upon the Savior as the signal of his ministry and who he was. That same living spirit anoints us too. And this is what John the baptizer was saying. And yes, John the baptizer, the proper translation. John the baptizer had been preaching, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And this is what he's referring to. So that even those who later on after Pentecost had received John's baptism, which was a sign for simply the forgiveness of sins. It was a sign of the forgiveness of sins by the one who was to come after him, who was mightier than him. So that was an indication of, okay, it's now time to repent. It's now time to get right and be cleansed of your sins and repent but it's coming in the one after me. So this is why in Acts uh, 17 and 18, you have followers of John uh, who have not yet received baptism in Christ or the Holy Ghost, really. They still had to hear how it ended, how the earthly phase of his ministry ended. They had to receive the anointing of uh, the benefits of Christ, basically, to know of their justification, to believe, and to be consecrated to service. So that only comes in Christ. John couldn't give that. So Christians, in other words, as you remember, initially that name came by the brethren in uh, Antioch, right? As those who were followers of the way, disciples of Christ uh, in his teachings. It was actually a, it was a slur. It was a pejorative. Mm -hmm. It was what the the people who didn't like them on the outside, it was something they came up with to, to make fun of them. Right. L- look at those little Christs, basically. Yeah. It was ultimately looking at them and saying, hey, they're following the teachings, the doctrines of that guy. They're following his life and the things he did. But it was true. They followed his doctrine and yeah. life. But they're also those who were engrafted in him by the spirit. They are those who are in fellowship or communion with him. It's really even not just those who follow then, but on the Christian side and the slur. It's those who are in Christ, right? Those who are truly partakers in him. And that's where you see that the preposition constantly in the New Testament, right, of being in Christ. Because through the Holy Spirit who is in us, we are mutually then in Christ. Christ in us, us in Christ. We truly partake from him as a wellspring of life. Right. Just a few observations on things you just said. First off, you mentioned earlier something about that it's important to maintain this order of justification and sanctification because, for instance, Rome Mm -hmm. essentially reverses it. In Rome, you are basically sanctified until you are justified. 
baptism washes away your original sin and then you're able to do meritorious works and so you need to do meritorious works until eventually you achieve some point of justification and if not in this life then you go to purgatory and you keep working on it until you get there that's not what this is this is you are in christ you are united to christ you are justified you are adopted And then in light of that, this is what happens. And that kind of leads into my second observation here. The necessity of this sanctification and the necessity of the transformation and change in one's life that it brings. If all of this that we have spoken of Christ is true, and it is true for us, we cannot be the same people that we were before it is impossible as the heidelberg catechism puts it in that section we'll get to lord willing later so carnal christianity worldly christianity is here excluded Mm -hmm. you cannot be united to christ you cannot experience these blessings these spiritual blessings and it not make you a different person, a different kind of person. Now, this is not to say that we are without sin in this life. As we have seen, this is very much a lifelong process. It is gradually worked in us with varying degrees of of failure and imperfection along the way. But there's a difference in who we are and how we approach it. Uh, We don't think about sin the same. We don't desire sin in the same way. We are grieved by our sin when it happens, and that is a fruit of these graces of the Holy Spirit in us. Yeah, and to that point, it would be a contradiction there being a carnal Christianity of sorts, a worldly Christianity. That's an oxymoron. We are in the world, but truly not of it, and that we are engrafted in something divine. We are engrafted in the Holy Son of God. So we have to take serious what, you know, what Paul says, uh, 2 Corinthians 6, what fellowship does righteousness have with unrighteousness or what communion with light and darkness, right? The nature of the Christian is a new creation, a renewed creation, so different than that radical fallen man, the nature of the fallen man, that it can truly be said to be new. Likewise, this is also where, where Paul would talk about It is no longer I who live, right? But Christ in me. Our head in heaven, whatever he does is what we do. You got to really play into that illustration. It's not the Westminster, it's in the Heidelberg. 1 Corinthians 12, you know, just as one body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. That's the key thing. In one spirit, uh, there, there in that verse, we could look at something like uh, Ephesians four, where we're charged by Paul to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and in you all. We, we see how we're not only united to Christ, but Christians are united to one another organically, like literally where we're talking organically in a mutual love wrought by spirit and word. We are joined to a head. And just as you think about your head, you could look at your, your hands, your fingers, you could wiggle them. They seem like there's something different, but it is a single head that is keeping the, your body alive You know, it's your head with your brain that's sending the signals to make your fingers move. It's the same tissue. It's the same muscles. It's the same flesh and blood. It's the same bones of a single body. So it is that Christ as our living head, by, by virtue of this one faith, wrought by the one spirit, with one baptism, even though we could go and look out and see, say, uh, Andrew got his own baptism, I have my own baptism, and yet it is the one and same baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We share all things in common in this spiritual life. We have the same Lord in Christ. And even then, he goes and distributes specific gifts and callings to each of us. Now, we all share in the office of believer, so we all share in being uh, in the requirements of a believer, those things of the faith itself. 
of having faith, but then we also share in the threefold office of Christ as prophet, priest, and king. And with those offices, we then apply them through our own distinct callings according to the skills that the Lord has bestowed upon us in this life. Some perhaps of hospitality, some perhaps skills of leadership or preaching, some of skills of, say, uh, education or graphic designing or whatever. We each have various gifts that might benefit one another and build the body in service. Right. To carry forward this analogy of the body, because this is exactly what Paul does in 1 Corinthians 12, where a body, we're all members of a body, but parts have different functions. Your big toe isn't the same as your spleen. And if you have a big toe in place of your spleen, you're going to have problems or if you have a spleen in the place of your big toe or whatever other parts, if they're not where they are properly supposed to be and performing their proper function, we're united together as a body. We have that unity, but then there is also this diversity in the body, you know, different people uh, called to different things, different giftings, different vocations, and yet together united in Christ and serving him together. Yeah, so in, in whom we are all growing up in. You could look at something like uh, yeah, Colossians 2, nine. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him. So there is nothing that a single one of us is actually lacking in this life of what is suitable for use of not only our own benefits, but for the advancement of the kingdom, which is why we are made, which is why we are called, which is why we are saved. It's for partaking in Christ, our King, as citizens of his kingdom. It's the, the one single kingdom program intended in the garden and to which we are going to even, an even better paradise of heaven and earth. We are made to go and to live in the service of Christ, to tell of his greatness and praise his name. I mean, you think about a prophet is someone who's worshiping God, right? Who's speaking to other people about him and the word of how, how wonderful he has uh, delivered sinners like us. For a king, or, you know, there's people who, you know, you can go out and you go and push against the wicked practices in this society, in this life. You write to congressmen, you go in, you pick it. I mean, you, you can go into a capital and you can demonstrate. You can preach to representatives. These are things where, yeah, there, there's evil at work in this world. And we are called to go and fight against them, the influences of Satan. And those things will wax and wane over time. But you, you continue to push. You continue to fight. It's, it's not only a personal thing, uh, fighting an inward sin and temptation, but it's also external. It is a without thing. Yeah, it is ultimately a spiritual battle, but it does manifest in many temporal and physical and material and historical outworkings here in time and space and on this earth. And we have our part to play in that, you know, as we talk about Christ's kingly office, which we already have and probably will again, for instance, mm -hmm. when we get into the Lord's mm -hmm. prayer, Christ's kingly office involves his subduing and conquering his and our enemies mm -hmm. it involves his kingdom coming as satan's kingdom is destroyed as the westminster puts it in discussing the lord's prayer that the kingdom of satan will be destroyed and the kingdom of grace may be advanced this is uh, what our confessional statements teach about the nature of christ's kingdom and how it works out in this world and in the more specific details of it in the larger catechism, it's not merely talking about the spiritual things and the advancement of the church. It talks about things like the Jews being called. This talks of, you know, the conversion of the Jews, which is a spiritual mm -hmm. thing. Uh, but also we see as various geopolitical implications in our world. You know, we had a solar eclipse a couple weeks ago and <laughs> the dispensationalists were at it again. <laughs> with how this was all going to be the end of the world and all the things happening in and around Israel. Not to get into all of that, because that's a way more complicated topic, the issues surrounding the nation of Israel and what's going on over there. But you just see that as one such example. What should Christians want for the Jews? They should want them to be uh -huh. Christians. Presently, many of them are not, and that's a problem. 
But also in that treatment of the Lord's Prayer, it talks about how we should pray that the church be countenanced and maintained by the civil magistrate. That was not changed in the American revisions. I'm guessing that many people probably wish that it was, but it wasn't, although other changes about the civil magistrate were made when the confession was revised at the founding of the United States. The civil magistrate still has certain duties and obligations to the church, and we as the church ought to pray for that and seek that as we're able. Mm -hmm. On that note, I'd like to read a section out from Zacharias or Sinus' commentary on the Heidelberg Catechism on this question and answer. I will point real fast at two things he notes from the prophetical office and then the, the priestly office, but it's the king that we want to point at, particularly in a moment. When he speaks about the Christian as prophet, he says, The prophetical dignity which is in Christians is an understanding, acknowledgement, and confession of the true doctrine of God necessary for our salvation. So he ties it into itself, our profession, faith. And well, you'll see in a second, he'll quote Matthew 10.32. He says, Our prophetic office is, one, rightly to know God and his will. So continue to search out the scriptures study it, be uh, under its preaching. Two, that everyone in his place and degree profess the same, being correctly understood, faithfully, boldly, and constantly, that God may thereby be celebrated and his truth revealed in its living force and power. So, in other words, he has in mind a reform of, of basically being under the word itself for our doctrines and not an ecumenicity, a false ecumenicity. Not a, oh, well, you have your doctrines, I have mine kind of thing. But, well, no, this is scripture. This is what it says. There is one faith. But then, right. and so in this, he says, Matthew 10, 32, this is the scriptural sum of the prophetic office. Whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I also confess before my father, which is in heaven. So a life of confession, uh, profession, as we might say. And two, the office of a priest is to teach, to intercede, and to offer sacrifice. Our priesthood, therefore, is to teach others, that is to show and communicate to them the knowledge of the true God. When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren, Luke 22, 32. Though this uh, point has been, in, and also the next point he's about to say, these have actually been tied by others into the prophetic office. Two, to call upon God, having a correct knowledge of him. Three, to render proper gratitude, worship, and obedience to God, or to offer sacrifices of thanksgiving, pleasing and acceptable to God, being sanctified by the sacrifice of Christ, which includes, one, that we offer ourselves by mortifying our old man and giving our members as instruments in righteousness unto God. So this should sound familiar. This is a lot of what Andrew and I have been saying here. Two, our prayers. Let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name, Hebrews thirteen fifteen. And three, our alms, thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God, Acts 10.4. Confession of the gospel, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, Romans 15.16. And five, cheerful and patient endurance of the cross and all of the various calamities which God sends upon us. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Philippians 2.17, 2 Timothy 4.6. So Christ communicates his priestly office unto us by accomplishing and bringing it to pass that we offer the above-named sacrifices of thanksgiving, and by causing them to be acceptable and pleasing to God. But here, I'm just going to read through this, uh, no comment, leave that to Andrew. The kingly office of Christians... The kingly office of Christians is, one, to oppose and overcome, through faith, the devil, the world, and all enemies. Two, having subdued all our enemies, to obtain at length, through the same faith, eternal life and glory. Come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Matthew twenty five thirty four. We are therefore kings. One, because we are lords over all creatures in Christ. For says the apostle, all things are yours. Uh, Corinthians 3.21 2. Because we conquer all our enemies through faith in Christ, who giveth us the victory. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. 1 Corinthians 15.57 and John 5.4 The kingship of Christ, however, differs from that of Christians in this 
The kingdom of Christ is hereditary, for he is the natural son of God, whilst we are the sons of God by adoption. But Christ as a son over his own house. God hath spoken unto us by Christ, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Hebrews 3, 6 and 1, 2. 2. He alone is king over all creatures, and especially over the church. But we are kings and lords, not of angels in the church, but only of other creatures. Heaven, earth, and therefore all things shall serve us, for we shall be crowned with glory, majesty, and the greatest excellency of gifts, so that we shall condemn devils and wicked men by cheerfully submitting and yielding to the judgment of God in passing sentence of condemnation upon them. Hence we are kings not over the church, but over all remaining creatures." Christ rules with full right, not only over the whole church, but also over all creatures. Ye shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. But ye not know that the saints shall judge the world. Matthew nineteen twenty eight and 1 Corinthians 6, 2. 3. Christ conquers his enemies by his own power, but we overcome our foes in and through him by his grace and assistance. Be of good comfort, I have overcome the world. John sixteen thirty three. For Christ rules the world by the scepter of his word and spirit, swaying our hearts and restoring in us his image, which was lost. You're getting into the Westminster larger catechism here. This is peculiar to Christ alone, for we are unable to give the Holy Spirit, being nothing more than ministers and administrators of the outward word and rites, as John the Baptist said. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, and shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? Matthew 3, 11, 1 Corinthians 3, 5. The use and importance of this doctrine is great. This is his wrap-up. 1. It is for consolation, because we are through faith engrafted into Christ as members to the head, that we may be continually sustained, governed, and quickened, that is made alive by him, and because he makes us prophets, priests, and kings unto God and his Father, by making us partakers of his anointing. This is truly and unspeakable dignity conferred upon Christians. 2. It is for admonition and exhortation, for since we are all prophets and teachers of God, we ought continually to celebrate and praise him. Since we are priests, we ought to offer ourselves wholly to God as living sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving. And since we are kings, it becomes us to fight manfully against sin, the world, and the devil, that we may reign with Christ. Well, Caleb, isn't that a theology of glory? That sure sounds like it. Don't we want a theology of the cross? Yes, I would say it is a theology of the glory of the cross. <laughs> Or as the cross, our glory. You know, just dragging in another often reductionistic and often unhelpful distinction that people like to make. Yeah. I mean, we see that, you know, as Christ is prophet, priest, and king, we are in certain ways invited to participate with him in that, up to and including the kingly office, up to and including proclaiming Christ in the world, but not only that they might be saved, but so that they might be brought under his rule and authority, that people might kiss the sun. Maybe to put it simply, if you are a Christian, it's okay to be a Christian, and then it is okay to want other people to be Christian, and it's okay to want the world to be subdued by his word and to be governed according to his word and his will. There's so much in our day of this sophistry this attempt to, I don't know how I would even properly describe it, I guess this uh, normalize and pathologize weakness. And there is a certain sense in which we are as Christians called to humility and we recognize that we are weak, we are frail, we are limited. But this doesn't mean that we engage in our faith in public with weakness. Right. Christ is our strength. <laughs> We're weak, right. but Christ is powerful. <laughs> right, and because Christ is powerful and Christ is living in us, because Christ subdues and conquers all his and our enemies, we ought to engage the world expectantly and hopefully that he will do such things, that the word will go forth and subdue, and that, yes, actually we do want people to hear his word and practice his word, not only in the church and in the spiritual 
aspects of life, but in the material and temporal as well, because it, it ultimately, it really all boils down to this. At the end of the day, Christianity is true. God is alive. God has revealed himself in his word, and this is how he has revealed himself. This is how he calls the people for his name. All of this is true, and everything else that is against it mm-hmm. is a lie. There was a debate a few weeks ago. I wouldn't call it much of a debate. It was an abject failure at being a debate, in large part due to the uh, moderation that didn't really occur. Mm-hmm. The moderator came instead wanting to debate. Uh, but it was on PresbyCast. And it was a it was a discussion. It was between Daryl Hart and uh, Miles Smith, who's an Anglican, and then Time and Klein and Stephen Wolf over issues pertaining to Christian nationalism. The big boogeyman that everybody wants to pile on. Oh no, you don't want to be a Christian nationalist now, do you? But anyway, one of the things that was revealed in that debate, and this isn't the first time we've seen it, the points that Daryl Hart and Brad Isbell, host of PresbyCast, kept coming back to is <laughs> things like, what about the Muslims? What about the Jews living in your country? Yeah, what about them? <laughs> what about them? <laughs> And actually, Miles Smith, the Anglican, I think, made this exact point at one point. He said, well, I don't really yeah. care. <laughs> and I think that's a good attitude to have about it. It's like, if we care, it's we care that they're serving false gods. They're worshiping idols. Right. We care that they convert. <laughs> yeah, we, we want we want them to be Christians. But also, we're not going to order our nation. We're not going to order our society. We're not going to engage society according to false pretenses. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't particularly care that my country is a comfortable place for Jews and Muslims because Mm -hmm. they need Christ. You know, they've got much more fundamental problems than can they practice their faith in public. They have a problem that their faith is false, their faith is a lie, and they need to leave it behind. We also should make the distinction, too, of, in a sense, false Christianity, Roman Catholicism. There was a immunity of sorts, a special favor shown to the papists in Louisiana's courts. The Supreme Court basically, in in a nutshell, made it a certain immunity of sorts for priests in being charged with sexual assault cases. This is partly over an issue of property rights. It is something of a partiality that is shown to the priesthood there. Uh, which this is a largely Roman Catholic area there in in Louisiana. It's not just that Christians should be given a special favor, Christians should be given a partiality, that there's a form of a Christian nationalism. It's not about Christian nationalism. It is about the moral law of God being promoted and enforced through the proclamation of Christ. (laughs) It is the application of Christianity biblically, it is not just right. oh hey you're you're you you call yourself a Christian well here a secret handshake and you, you here let's give you some civil benefits that's not that the fullness and breadth of the law of God in all the things of, of that we would love to see in a society would not be realized fully until the end in their perfection and their complete right. blessedness but it doesn't mean it is not something worth proclaiming and striving for (laughs) or practicing. Yeah. You know, sort of like our personal sanctification we were talking about earlier, just because we don't arrive there perfectly doesn't mean we don't strive or move in that direction at all. Mm -hmm. You know, what is true of individuals can also be true of societies just because we Mm -hmm. cannot ever achieve the perfect ideal in this life. Yes, even in the most, in the society's most properly ordered according to God's word and God's law, yeah, there's still going to be flaws and defects and errors and all that, but we can be closer than not. Uh, Certainly, we could be at least theoretically closer than we are now when we see a lot of the vice and wickedness around us in the world that we Mm -hmm. have on this show documented at some length. At some point, as Christians, we have to recognize it's okay to be Christian and it's okay to want Christian things. 
and to work and strive for them. And I think we're kind of seeing a reckoning with that in the church and in the world around us. Yeah, there's an element in this in which we should understand that institutions and the, the influence of, of Christianity, really of, of scripture, of the word of the Lord's influence in this world and in various parts of the world, they wax and wane. There's ground that is won, there's ground that is conceded and lost, uh, to use a metaphor. You can have at one time, you know, uh, yeah, great, strong educational institutions, uh, universities, and then they are given over. There are other times where you could have yeah, more or less influence in the government. These things can be lost, but they can also be, influence could also be regained. What we're looking at, though, in, in terms of this in Lord's Day 12 and in our catechisms, is that Christ has fulfilled righteousness, and Christ's righteousness is being outworked in his people, and therefore also through his people. Piety is, yes, something that's personal and internal, but piety also must have its application and its fruits. And this is where Ursinus, in talking about the importance of the doctrine, you, you note how they're, they're not just personal things, but they are for outward use in confession. Not a personalized confession alone, but externally. A confession that goes out to the world. This is part of the church's witness yeah. to know God and his will. Yeah, as Christ talks about confessing his name before men, mm -hmm. that implies that you're confessing yeah. him in such a way that other people are going to see and hear it. That you're confessing him before men. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not just confessing him privately or even confessing him in a situation where you're surrounded by other people who also confess him because he talks about it in a context of mm -hmm. hostility and persecution and opposition. Mm -hmm. So when you're speaking of the, the priesthood, you're talking about yeah, mortifying your old man, which in giving yourself as members of instruments of righteousness, th this is an internal aspect. But then he talks about also, yeah, uh, in the use of prayers in the confession of the gospel, he'll talk about it in terms of teaching others, communicating to others, showing them how to talk about these things. He starts going to these outward proclamations, outward interactions to offer yourself, basically, in everything you do is, is the point of the priestly office. But And then we already went over the king office. Yeah, Christianity isn't something that stays internal and private. It is something that must, by necessity occur through the whole person, not just a soul. Right. We are belong to him body and soul. Right. As I talked about earlier, you know, mm -hmm. if, if this is true of us, we're not the same people. Mm -hmm. It's not merely a matter of we change certain things about us and certain behaviors in certain situations. If we're different people, that's going to work out not only in the private life, in the ecclesiastical life, but in all spheres of life in which we participate. Yeah, to be clear on that, it, it starts and ends by spirit and word. Mm -hmm. It's that the spirit and word from first to last is doing this. But in this, we are living it out, <laughs> I guess you could say. We are Christians wherever we go. Yep. That is what it is to be in Christ. We are not just in Christ in one place, in church, in a monastery, whatever. We're not just in Christ in church. We are in Christ in the world until he calls right. us out of it or until heaven uh, and earth join together in the consummation. Yep. And everything we are and everything we do ought to properly reflect that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't leave faith at the door. So yeah, <laughs> I think we beat this to death. Yeah, yeah. got off into some weeds. I didn't quite expect that we would but me either but oh, i well. welcome it <laughs> it's content <laughs> that's right good weeds yeah <laughs> so this has been once for all delivered we thank you for listening if you have any questions comments complaints you can reach us the usual places ofad podcast at gmail.com twitter facebook at ofad podcast yeah I don't know what else to say because we don't plan our outros just as we don't plan our intros. And just as we don't plan our middle continent. I'm kidding. <laughs> so, yeah, that indeed is it. We don't have, I think, even any particular updates other than that. Pray for us. Pray for us and uh, pray for our congregations. 
pray for our personal lives and also uh, pray for OFAD and its use for you uh, listeners as well. And other than that, I think we uh, we need Heidi to take it. Yes. Yes. Thank you for listening to this episode. For the latest news and updates, visit our substack at onceforalldelivered.com, where you can also support our work with a paid subscription. You can also follow us on social media at OFAD Podcast. If you like what you have heard, leave a five-star review where you get your podcasts and spread the word about the show. Once For All Delivered is hosted by Andrew Smith and Caleb Castro and produced by Andrew and Heidi Smith. A special thank you to our founding members, Eric and Kathy Hepker. We hope you will join us again next time on Once For All Delivered.